We're looking here at about 4 million years of hominin evolution, from Australopithecines 3.5 million years ago, to Homo erectus about a million years ago, and then modern Homo sapiens, you and me. Our brains got bigger, increased by a factor of three or so. Why? If we knew the answer to this question, we could figure out what were the conditions that selected for bigger brains. And if we knew that, it would help us answer the question of whether we should or should not expect alien civilizations elsewhere. We humans think that our brains are very important. We are so convinced of this that when we imagine advanced aliens, we imagine them with gigantic heads here and here. But how do you measure gigantic heads? How do you measure brain size? How do you measure intelligence? There are many different ways to measure this. It's surprising. For example, you could talk about absolute brain size, in which case, for example, elephants have bigger brains than human beings. So elephants would be smarter if that's what you, how you measured it. You could talk about encephalization quotient, which is essentially defined here as the actual brain mass divided by the brain mass you would expect for a typical mammal of that body size. When you do that, a little bit of word jungle there, then you get humans have the largest encephalization quotient. Or you could say, wait a minute, let's just talk about what fraction of your body is the mass of your brain. And that's what this is, in which case a mouse has about 8 or 10% of its body is made out of brain. Ours is 2%. Another way, alternative ways to measure brain size is the uh, number of neurons in your brain, or the number of neurons plus other glial cells that you have in your brain, or the number of neurons on the outside, on the cortex. All different ways to measure brain size. Now, here's a plot of a bunch of different uh, vertebrates, and on the x-axis is body weight. Notice the logarithmic scale in kilograms. The y-axis is grams in brain weight. And uh, the absolute brain size is the y-axis, So, and humans are right here. So if you're interested in absolute brain size, then there are four blue dots up here that are bigger. They happen to be whales and elephants. So if absolute brain size meant was proportional to something called intelligence, then whales and, ele and uh, elephants would be smarter than humans. But that's not the only way to measure brain size. Let's talk about brain size as a percentage of body mass. Now, just to get your bearings here, this line here is if you don't have a body and it's 100% brain. And everything in the upper left is when your brain is more than 100% of your body, which is impossible, so don't even think about that red area. So here's this 100% body weight is 100% of your body weight is your brain. And the slope is r equals 1. The slope is r. It's equal to 1. That makes it a diagonal. What happens if 10% of your body is your brain? Then you're along this line. If 1% of your body is your brain, you're there. And if 0.1% of your body is brain, you're on that last line. So humans are in the upper right there in the green. But over here, you'll, there are hummingbirds, squirrel monkeys, and mice. And you'll notice that these small critters, where size is important, they have a larger fraction of their body is their brain. And so they are more intelligent than humans, if this is the way you measure intelligence. Along the line R equals 1, your brain weight is proportional to your body weight. What that means is the bigger the body, the bigger the brain. This is known as uh, allometry, allometry. The bigger the body, the bigger the brain. The bigger the body, the bigger the organ. So uh, the cat brain on the left, the monkey has a bigger body, has a bigger brain. Humans have a bigger body, has a bigger brain. That's not surprising. That's just allometry. And uh, that's, well, <laughs> that's, don't know what to say about that. Anyway, here are the bony fish. Now, the red dots are the birds, and the yellow are the reptiles. So let's label them and put a little oval there. And the blue dots are the mammals, and among the mammals are primates. The primates are in green. So let's label those. There are the mammals. Here are the primates. And there are the humans. Now notice, when you compare the slopes of these ovals to the R equals 1 line, you'll see that they tilt over a little bit more. Their slopes are a little bit less than 1. What that means is, 
if you double the size of the body, you don't quite double the size of the brain. The brain doesn't keep up with the size of the body. That's why these slopes are tilted over compared to the R equals 1 line. If you fit the lines to mammals, you get R equals about 0.6. If you fit the line to primates, you get R equals 0.7, a little bit steeper, a little bit close to R equals 1. Now, the encephalization quotient is, is kind of easy to understand. Just to think of the following. If, you have, if you're a human being and you have a body weight of 50 kilograms, then, and you know how big your brain is, it's about 1,300 grams. And, but if you, were an av if you were a mammal of 50 kilograms, an average mammal, then this is, would be your brain size. And so when you divide your actual brain size by the expected brain size, that would be your encephalization quotient. However, you know you're a primate. So if you take a 50 kilogram primate and go up to the line, the expected mean line for primates, then your brain size should be about oh, 0,800 or so. And then your encephalization quotient would be your 1,300 or 1,400 gram brain divided by the predicted brain, which is 800 which means that your encephalization quotient isn't nearly as high if you compare yourself to primates as if you compare yourself to mammals. So the encephalization quotient depends on what you're comparing yourself to. And so you make, when you make a big table on the left, on the right, you have, compared to mammals, the human EQ is 8. Compared to primates, 3. Compared to small monkeys, only 1. So this whole thing of EQ being a way to show that we are special is slightly ambiguous. Let's look a little bit more carefully at that not only the humans that are living today, but let's look at some of the ancestors and plot them inside of this square. When you do that, you can see, oh, there's Neanderthal, there's Homo sapiens, there's Homo erectus, there's Homo habilis, and there's Australopithecus africanus. And you can see that green dashed line is very, very steep in this same plot. And so really our brains increased rapidly. Australopithecines line is not so rapid and then the other great apes. And remember, human beings come you know, anywhere from 40 kilos to 100 kilos, and so you have to, th and other species were probably had different sizes too, and so you have to think of those not as little dots, but bigger blobs. Now, so it's important to realize that first our ancestors lost the canines, then we became bipedal, and only then did we get bigger brains. Now, what is misleading about this plot is that it looks like we evolved from chimpanzees, which we know is not the case because we know this phylogeny. Chimps are alive today. Humans are alive today. What we did evolve from was an ancestor, common ancestor, seven million years ago. But to be fair, it, that common ancestor probably had big canines, and so it's not completely misleading to say that uh, you know we evolved from some skull that had big canines. All right. Now, the history of the size of our brains is plotted here. In the x-axis, we have the most recent 3 million years. Present is on the right. Cranial capacity is on the left. You can see that uh, 3 million years ago, the brain capacity of our ancestors were about here. And then it doubled, and then it tripled. So in 3 million years, the size of our brains tripled. That's an enormous increase in brain size almost unprecedented, maybe completely unprecedented. It's so important that here's another plot of the same thing where the, the uh, species are labeled the, uh, the Homo erectus and Paranthropus and Australopithecus and Neanderthal are all labeled here. And again, you see the same thing in the last three million years, an increase by a factor of three in brain size. Here's another uh, factor, another plot of the same thing. But here we have Neanderthals. Are, they say that Neanderthals' brains are a little bit lower, smaller than ours, and that doesn't seem to be the case. So let's look a little bit more carefully at a comparison between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Now here are four skulls. The, one, the two on the left are uh, Neanderthals. The two on the right are called Homo sapiens. The one on the far left is an early Neanderthal 430,000 years ago. And almost 400,000 years later, we have a late Neanderthal 50,000 years ago. And you can see they're not that different. On the, on the third one from the left, you have what's called an early Homo sapiens. It was found in Morocco recently, and it's about 300,000 years old. And then on the right, we have 20,000-year-old late Homo sapiens from France. 
And uh, there you can see that the Homo sapiens, uh, they're pretty big brains, and Neanderthals have big brains as well. Now, during this factor of three increase, which parts of the brain increased in size? The answer is that all parts, particularly the frontal cortex underneath your forehead, but not the olfactory system or the medulla oblongata. Let's look at this olfactory system. On the brain on the left, you can see this is looking at the brain from the underside, and you can see, if you look carefully, there's a lobe labeled 2, and that is your olfactory lobe, and there's one right next to it on the right side. Now, when you plot in the middle plot brain weight, or olfactory bulb size as a function of brain weight, you can see that Homo sapiens are way off to the right, which essentially means for an organism of such a big brain, our sense of smell really stinks. Another way to look at the same thing is on the plot on the right. The x-axis is the number of olfactory receptor genes. Now, don't, look, don't forget, about, forget about the red or blue. They're just genes that have to do with uh, being sensitive to different types of smells. And you can see that the elephant has an enormous range, enormous, gigantic nose that can smell all kinds of things. Uh, and we humans and primates down at the bottom, we're just terrible at smelling. And so our, the world of olfaction is just depauperate for human beings. So although we have this great cortex, we have this tiny olfactory system. Maybe one played off against the other. Experts agree that such a rapid growth in brain size, independent of its evolutionary driving forces, must be based on a relatively simple genetic mechanism. So in other words, we don't really know what the driving forces were, but whatever they were, it's simple genetically to get there. And if you're interested in that concept, read the references in the lower right. Here's a plot of age, present on the left, 1 million years, 10 million years, 100 million years ago, and the encephalization quotient, or braininess index on the left, and you can see that it has increased very quickly in the last three million years or so. But remember that this is quite a, an ambiguous statement because it depends on who you're comparing, which group of animals you're comparing Homo sapiens to. Now, there are two problems with big brains. One is a metabolic problem. Our brains are 2% the mass of our body, but it uses up, they use up 20% of the energy, which means that brain cells are 10 times more energetically expensive than normal cells. So who wants a brain if it costs that much energy? I'd rather just you know, use that energy for running and for muscles and, and other things. The other problem with big brains is developmental. Now, if you want to be an efficient walker, you have to have a small, narrow pelvis. But if you want to be a mother that can give birth to a big brain baby, you need a broad pelvis. So there are two things that are pulling in opposite directions. That's a problem. So whatever the explanation is for our big brains, it has to satisfy some requirements. One important requirement has to be unique to the genus Homo, because that's the only place where we see this factor of three increase in three million years. This is difficult because of the wide variety of environments and the large number of mammals or other primates that could have been in similar circumstances but did not have their brain size increased by factors of three. Also, this increase comes only after our transition to bipedalism, so that's the chronology, but this increase has to come with our use of fire and language. So we have some hypotheses. Our hypotheses are our brains tripled in size over the last three million years because why? You could say, well, it's just better to be smart than stupid, but that doesn't work because that applies to all species, and we don't see other species having this increase, such a rapid increase in brain size. Another hypothesis? Maybe it's because of our invention of fire and cooking and then the shorter intestines, energy savings, and then we could afford to have brains. Or maybe we've developed language, and maybe the memes of our language said, hey, I need a bigger brain in order to store myself and pass myself around. Um, let's look at this uh, fire cooking hypothesis a little bit more carefully. It seems to be popular. So some researchers think that cooking is the invention that probably made us human. Here on the uh, y-axis is the size of your brain, half a kilogram, one kilogram, 1.5 kilogram today, Homo sapiens. And the time axis is seven million years ago till today. You can see that the yellow line increases by factor of three over the last three million years. And when did we have cooking? Well, we've had cooking for the last two million years or so. So maybe cooking is responsible. What is cooking? 
what is, why, how could that possibly be related to getting a bigger brain? Well, cooked food is softer. It turns into mush in your mouth, and you can eat more in less time. And your gut does not have to be as long, and so you save all the energy that otherwise would go to your gut. Which means, if you're cooking food, you can afford big brains energetically. And not only that, you have time to do interesting things with your brains. We could think of other things besides food. If you look at a orangutan or a, or a chimp or a gorilla, how they spend their time, a lot of it, an inordinate amount, is spent on finding food and eating it and chewing it. But brains, uh, with uh, cooking, whoop, we just put it in there quick and we have time to think about other things. Like, where did we come from? The one thing about cooking is you have to have fire before you can cook, and so the invention of fire, we're not quite sure, somewhere around two million years ago. And, uh, and so that's consistent with the, uh, the brain size increase when we got fire. There are other hypotheses, however. One is called the complex social abilities, or the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis. And this idea is inspired by the book on the right. It's called The Prince by Machiavelli. And in it, it talks about how wonderful it is and how beautiful and intelligent you are if you're a prince and you know how to deceive and recognize deception and apply counter-deception. And that's one hypothesis about why our brains got bigger. We lived in social groups and we needed to fool each other. Another hypothesis is collective learning and the importance of collective learning. When we have language and we sit around a campfire, we tell each other stories, we pass information around, and that leads to more adaptive abilities to make tools, for example. And more recently, we have these collected in books and writing. Now, this is a nice story about cooking, about how we think the brain is important, but maybe there's something suspicious. I, I used to think the brain was the most important organ until I realized what was telling me that. Our brains have gotten so big that we've cleverly figured out not to trust them. And if fire and cooking and language has allowed us to get bigger brains, how in the universe are we going to figure out whether a species on another planet could evolve to make fire?